chronic pancreatitis. First of all, before I start, I would like to thank Professor Ishaduddin Ahmed. I would like to thank um, Professor uh, Jahangir. Now I know that he's my batmate. Mm -hmm. Professor Jahangir is the chairman and the head of the Department of Gastroenterology of Cellular Imaging Osmani Medical College. Then mm -hmm. Professor Rajibul Alam, he is a, also a professor of gastroenterology as well as uh, he is serving as a faculty in Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. And uh, Dr. Ishuddin Ahmed is a bona fide faculty of PHA. And I will probably also request to be a faculty for our um, organization. I will also send the request to Professor Jahangir as well as Professor Razibul Alam. Um, today, uh, we have also Dr. Raj Shah uh, from our own institution, one of the leading uh, medical college in America, as well as um, uh, one of the best residency program in America, University of Central Florida, Orlando. Uh, our best resident, in fact, this year. And also he will be serving as a chief resident next year. Dr. Raj Shah is with us. Um, he has tremendous interest in gastroenterology, do a lot of research. In fact, he's the recipient of the President Award of uh, Annual Conference of Bangladesh, uh, American College of Gastroenterology last year. Uh, I also have Joshua Culverson. Joshua is rotating with me at this point. Uh, he's doing some research. He has also a lot of interest in, 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 in gastroenterology. So I take the opportunity to um, let them present some cases. Chronic pancreatitis is a very common uh, thing we, we see everywhere. And with the advent of newer technology, it become uh, a very uh, um, interesting, as well as uh, one of the very important tool to catch pancreatic cancer early. Um, so today, uh, the way we'll do it is first, I'll just start with a little bit of pan uh, pancreatitis talk, and then I'll let Raj present his cases, and then we'll have the discussion. In the context of Bangladesh and America, I just wanted to uh, ask one thing. Uh, Eshad, do you have endoscopic ultrasonogram in Chittagong? Oh. It's available in uh, DSMU. So, so, Rajiv. so Rajiv has uh, has the accessibility yeah. of that. Yeah. Jahangir, do you do you have it accessible as well? No, no. Okay, so this is something that uh, will be very beneficial for us, and probably um, in this area we can we can talk a little bit, and these are the areas we can work, start working together to develop in Bangladesh. Um, so uh, let's. Uh, uh, I will just. Uh, do a little screen sharing first. So, you know, though we call it chronic pancreatitis, but in a broader sense, um, when you talk about uh, objective of a disease, this is not just a disease, this is a syndrome. We, we consider it as a syndrome. And when we call it as a syndrome, it has to be the presence of the appropriate symptoms. Also, it has to be the exposure of the known risk factor. Also, derangement of the pancreatic exocrine and endocrine function has to have infiltrative cells as seen around islet cells loss and fibrosis. That means there has to be have histological changes in the pancreas. Also, there can be calcified ductal and parenchymal stone development. So this syndrome has at least three of those five criteria fulfilled. Then we can call it chronic pancreatitis. <laughs> Can you uh, just, uh, um, beside me, can you just uh, mute it so we can hear? So in America, the incidence is, is quite low, though as a gastroenterologist, I see quite a bit. The incidence is about eight, eight in 100,000 and prevalence is 50 in 100,000. It's not, not, not small number, it's quite big. Uh, later of the discussion, we'll talk about it in Bangladesh, what is the incidence and prevalence. In America, the number one cause is alcohol. 
about 44%. That's the patient we see all the time. A lot of them also from chronic obstructive pancreatic disease. And that can be related to chronic obstructive common bile duct disease as well. Another weak chunk is about 10% is genetic. And it is important chunk because that's the segment also have higher risk of pancreatic cancer. Uh, we have a small portion is autoimmune. Infectious and other autoimmune problem can be 7%. And there's about 30%, a big chunk. We don't know the appropriate cause. And that we call idiopathic chronic pancreatitis. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so what is the common features we all see is abdominal pain, exocrine insufficiency, endocrine consequences, and that's what we call type 3C diabetes, which is very brittle um, diabetes, um, very resistant diabetes. Also, we can see a wide range of malnutrition, metabolic bone diseases, cystocytosis formation. Very commonly, we also see splenic venous thrombosis. About 4% of these patients can go to pancreatic malignancy. And we also see a quite a big number of gastroparesis, which we don't even find out. In fact, many patients come to us for gastroparesis and we do the workup and find out this patient has chronic pancreatitis. So when you talk about the genetics, when you talk about the genetics, there is some genetic factor causes pancreatitis. The mutation and PRSS1 is the most biggest one. And other mut mutations can predispose the chronic pancreatitis. And one is Sphinx1, we know. CFTR, which is in cystic fibrosis, chymotrypsin C, CASR, Faudin, and also very rare genetic mutation. Now there's one variety we see very often is called autoimmune pancreatitis. And there is a paper published from India. Probably the incidence of India and Bangladesh is pretty similar. Very often is overlooked. Very often is diagnosed as pancreatic malignancy. More than half of the patient ends up having pancreatic surgery without any reason. And this area need to be, we pay more attention. Autoimmune pancreatitis, obviously, from your autoimmune sources, it is IgG4 associated, but it's not specific. We can also see other uh, diseases associated with that, salivary disease, salivary gland, they, they have atrophic salivary gland, they have autoimmune kidney problem, Ig nephropathy, they have biliary problem as well, they have sclerosing cholangitis associated with that. Also, we have retroperitoneal fibrosis, we have um, primary uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is type one, where you have a wide range of autoimmune problem, all related to IgG4. So IgG4 level immediately can diagnose it if it's positive. But sometimes it may not be IgG4 mediated and it's not systemic disease. Then we really have to depend on the biopsy. And both look like it's malignancy. People have significant weight loss, Pancreas, pancreas look funny. The good thing is it is responsive to a steroid. Not only that, it can also respond very well to six market to purin or some biological agents if it doesn't respond to a steroid. So there is a steroid sparing agents which you can use. And this is how it look like on a MRI where you can see definitive irregularity of the pancreatic duct. You can see some cut off of the pancreatic duct. Right in this area, you can see that. Also, you can see this big sausage, big swollen pancreas. Sometimes you can also see dilated pancreas as well. So, when you have autoimmune pancreatitis, obviously besides doing the immunological test, we can take the histologic test. We can do a US and the biopsy, endoscopic ultrasonogram. We can do MRI for any patient with chronic pancreatitis I'm talking about. 
uh, we have a wide range of tests. Some is structural changes test, some are functional chest test. So structurally, we depend on MRI or CT scan first. Then we go to more invasive tests like ERCP or sonogram. Um, good KUB has some role where, where you can see the obvious pancreatitis uh, calcification. But also the gold standard is the functional test. And the functional test we do is secretin test, cholecystokinin test, test. We can also do fecal elastase test, which is also quite common. Serum trypsin, fecal chymotrypsins, fecal fat, 24 hour collection of the fat and serum glucose to see end organ damage and type C diabetes, 3C diabetes. So this is a CT scan of a patient. You can see massive uh, calcification. Obviously, it's, it's chronic pancreatitis. You can do X-ray and you can see the whole pancreas is calcified. You can do a MR, a ERCP and you can see you have um, irregular pancreatic duct, some calcification and also stone inside the pancreatic duct. So these are the hallmarks uh, for um, chronic pancreatitis. You can do MRCP, you can see the corrugated, dilated ducts, um, you can see a uh, stone formation. You can see that whole pancreatic duct is turned to be quite uh, irregular with the classification stone formation. Uh, when you do endoscopy, we can see um, a hypoechoic focal. Um, we can see uh, also calcification um, and it's very helpful. We can see the dilatation of the duct um, and quite significant is more than 10 millimeters. So these are the things uh, will promptly help you to diagnose chronic pancreatitis. But when we do endoscopic ultrasonogram, we quickly change the scope and we take a quick biopsy and the biopsy shows us chronic inflammatory cells, um, histiocyte, plasma cells um, help us to diagnose. You can also do the immunohistochemistry, also genetic um, immunohistochemistry and find more obvious and definitive diagnosis. Um, so a patient with chronic pancreatitis, uh, there is something called Rosemont system. Those who do US, we basically have look for six uh, criteria. Uh, those are basically um, calcification, main pancreatic duct irregularity, visible side branches, hyperacrep duct wall. Uh, also look for lobularity, cystic appearance, hyperacrep focus or hyperacrep duct. Uh, so out of six, out of this nine, if, if it's more than six, it's a definitive diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. If it's zero to one, it's normal. If it's three to four, there is indeterminate. And these are the cases we take biopsy to diagnose it. Uh, so I'm pretty sure secreting test is done in some place in Bangladesh where when I was a fellow in New York, uh, Dr. Drilling came up with this uh, um, double lumen tube. One part of the lumen go to the uh, duodenum uh, right next to the uh, ampulla, another go to open in the stomach. Uh, we give secretin and for 60 minutes, we give recombinant secretion for 60 minutes, we, we collect uh, the acid and also the bicarbonate. And we would like to see the peak bicarbonate is more than 80 milli equivalent per liter. If it's less than that, that's a positive secretin test. Um, Nowadays, with the advent of radiological test and endoscopic ultrasonogram, we don't do it very often, but still, there is a utility of this test. I still do secreting tests for some patients. Um, so when you talked about the treatment, uh, medical therapy, still we use it, we call 3A, abstinence of the bad thing like alcohol, smoking, also analgesic and adjuvenate agents enzymes, octreotide, and antioxidant. I'll tell a little bit about it and the endoscopic treatment where we do remove the stone and stricture for the symptomatic cases. We do neurolysis, both patient pain management also endoscopically, and I'll tell you the role of it. And the bigger role basically is surgical treatment where we do drainage and the resection, the surgeon does it. Um, if I talk to you about the medical therapy, if we talk about all the randomized control trials, it shows that abstinence is good, but very unpredictable. So it may work, it may not work. The best medicine for the effective pain control is tramadol uh, with a combination of acetaminophen, 
Sometimes we use the adjuvant therapy like gabapentin to reduce the pain. <clears throat> enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, all of us write it, but it has a very little data to prove it in the randomized control trial. A lot of people use antioxidant, vitamin E. It has mixed result and uh, the randomized control trial doesn't really support it. Um, before we go to endoscopic versus surgical treatment, um, I can tell you two big study uh, where one is published, the left side was published in um, American Journal of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy three years ago, and there is in New England Medical Journals four years ago, where there is patients literally uh, randomized. Um, 72 patients in one study, 39 patients in other study. ERCP was done in 50% of the patient, 57% stone was extracted in 23% of the patients. In the other group, they have to do five sessions over the period of five years. The patient who go to resection, surgical treatment, resection about 80% and 10% go for drainage. After one year, the pain relief is almost the same, but after five years, only 14% patient who go for endoscopy has the pain, adequate pain control, uh, but surgery was about 37%. So surgery is clearly superior on the first study, but on the second study where they follow it for a longer times where patients multiple ERCP, stain placement, stone removal done versus surgery, they did, they did go for a big surgery, pancreatic genostomy for 50% of the patient. At the end of two years, a surgical patient has significant pain management data, 72% versus endoscopy, only 32%. At five years, surgery is very durable, 90% patient do very well. Endoscopy, we, it didn't work. It was only used for palliative purposes. So clearly, patient who has a significant symptoms, uh, malnutrition, weight loss, uh, the surgery is the way to go. Uh, and endoscopically, a lot of people brag about endoscope-related US but all the randomized control trial proven that it doesn't work. So if somebody wants to do it, tell them not to do it. So surgical treatment is the best, long-term relief, immediate relief, and total pancreatectomy is the best process. Now, when people have chronic pancreatitis, they will have an exocrine insufficiency. And the best test all of us do is fecal elastase. I'm pretty sure in Bangladesh, we have fecal elastase as well. If it's less than 200, then you know the, it's a very sensitive test. It's a less sensitive, but very specific test. And all these patients, we need to give them 90,000 USP of lipase per meal. This is the magic number immediately or during the meal. If you don't give the enteric coded one, which is cheaper, then you have to give PPI or H2 receptor blocker to suppress the acid for that to work. And a lot of patients, 60% of patients, the enzyme doesn't work because they don't take it adequately. They're non-compliance. And when you give this treatment, don't forget to give vitamin D and calcium. And if you're not giving a long acting enteric coated one, you have to give them PPI or H2 receptor blocker. So this is the things, about 4% of the patient will have cancer. They can have a splenic thrombosis and this patient has to go for a splenectomy. They can have also a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndrome. They will have gastroparesis. Some of them will have, have pseudocyst and common biotic obstruction and they have to go for endoscopic or surgical treatment. So at this point, I would like to request uh, Raj to bring your cases and we'll discuss among all the faculties about those cases. Sure, sir, so just give me a moment. Hopefully you're able to see the presentation. Yes. Um, and it's in the presentation mode, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we'll start with our case one, but before that, I'd like to thank Dr. Atik for this opportunity and hello everyone. Um, 
So our first case is going to be this, which is a 52-year-old male who had three previous admissions for acute alcoholic pancreatitis. He now returns to your clinic complaining of 20 pound weight loss. He stopped drinking, but he continues to smoke one pack per day. He does report a normal appetite, but he has a mild constant epigastric pain. His physical exam was notable for evidence of loss of muscle mass. His lab showed a pre-albumin of 16, albumin of 3.1, normal liver chemistry and a mileage of 22. CT scan revealed an atrophic pancreas with a pancreatic duct of 6 mm with some calcification in the side branches of the pancreatic duct. No mass is noted. So Thank the you. question is, which of the following tests would you recommend now? Fecal elastase, serum calcium, serum CA 99, EUS, ERCP, or surgical consultation. Can you go to the last slide, please? Yes, sir. So we have a patient who has recurrent um, pancreatitis. Uh, he's one of our typical patient of chronic pancreatitis. He is alcoholic. Uh, will stop drinking, but he still smoke. And as I told you, when you talk about three A abstinence, he's not following that uh, completely. He has uh, fullness and abdominal pain. He's clearly losing weight. His muscle mass is reducing. You can see his pre-albumin is going down. Albumin is a little low. Uh, he has liver function test is normal. Amylase is also normal, but he has atrophic pancreatitis with pancreatic duct is six millimeter, which mildly elevated uh, with some calcification. So um, my, I would like to open this case uh, for any further question to Dr. Ish, our faculty today. Uh, Ishad Razib or Jahangir. <clears throat> so this is. Hello. Yes, yeah, you can hear it. Uh, this is a, a clear cut cases of uh, chronic pancreatitis. It is. Uh, and he has, um, you know, clear cut um, pancreatitis. You know the cause of it. He fulfill all the criteria of pancreatic, uh, chronic pancreatitis syndrome. And the question is, at uh, this patient was losing weight, uh, has uh, calcification, has muscle mass loss. Uh, 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 obviously, one of our big concern of this patient is uh, about four percent of these patients can turn to um, pancreatic cancer. So obviously, uh, the next slide, please, uh, Raj. Yes. So we have uh, fecal elastase. Usually we, we check for uh, deficiency of exocrine deficiency. Uh, serum CA19-9 is a marker for pancreatic cancer, but we all know that this marker is not the best way yes. to pinpoint it. And uh, we have endoscopic ultrasonogram and we, have, we can call for a surgical consultation. Right now we have some bright Bangladeshi young physician is working with us. And I see Dr. Abdul Rahman is here. A patient really like him a lot. I would like to ask Abdul Rahman Shawan, would you what do you think is the right answer? Dr. Shawan? Or Alamin or Zakia, uh, one of you. Sir, sir, the answer may. Hello? Sir, the answer may be uh, endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound. Um, any uh, next slide? So, next slide is fecal elastase. So, this is something very important for us to know when to order endoscopic ultrasonogram. We are going to discuss that uh, in next few slides, but a patient with clear cut uh, chronic pancreatitis, one of the area I was just discussing in my previous slide is uh, exocrine uh, pancreatic deficiency. And that's what this patient has. He has abdominal pain, 
here some muscle wasting. Um, so before we go to endoscopic ultrasonogram, the criteria to do endoscopic ultrasonogram is few. One is if your pancreatic duct is more than 10 millimeter, this patient, it was six millimeter. Uh, he does have weight loss, but that can be possible with fecal elastase as well. Uh, and your radiological study uh, did not show, it shows some calcification, but it shows very good side branch of the pancreatic duct. So I think doing the fecal elastase and giving this patient adequate um, enzymes uh, is something very important. Also, look for endocrine uh, deficiency as well is also an important thing to do. Um, calcium and vitamin D is very important for this patient. Adequate nutritional support is also very important for this patient. Um, at this point, I would ask uh, Professor Rajiv to do any comments about this question. Anything else you want to add? Uh, one thing I want to ask, uh, am, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, you are. You are. Yeah, one thing I ask, is his diabetes well controlled? Uh, probably, you know, uh, I, probably I have mixed, I have missed that point. Is his diabetes well controlled? You know, that's is a very good question. Uh, I, I was just telling you that endocrine deficiency is also another thing. And if we go to the last slide. So he's, he has normal liver function test Laps, laps, the abnormal laps. So there's the, the blood sugar was good. It was not mentioned here, but I yeah. think it was good. That was not, that's why it, it wasn't mentioned here. So, yes, his, his blood sugar is very important. So blood sugar loss is- of muscle mass And deterioration, loss of muscle mass and deterioration could be due to uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, one Absolutely. thing is that- another, Absolutely. Another, 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 he, he was on, uh, was he or uh, was the patient uh, on uh, enzymes? Uh, exocrine uh, uh, replacement. Uh, if yes. the patient was on exocrine replacement, uh, is the patient is the patient compliant or not? Uh, was that ensured the patient is compliant regarding uh, the abstinence of alcohol and other things uh, regarding the uh, regular medication? Uh, whether the uh, right form of medication are they are they enteric coated? Uh, whether it was uh, along with adequate dose of PPI. Uh, these things, uh, uh, these things should have uh, been mentioned here. Yes, yes, these are well taken care of. These were well taken care of. Uh, after that, if if these things are well maintained and well ensured, uh, after that, um, uh, yes, uh, this this the situation may be due to if the exocrine function is okay, uh, then maybe due to exocrine replacement is okay. I should only say. So uh, maybe uh, we should. Uh, look for such for any deterioration or complication of chronic pancreatitis like uh, pancreatic malignancy. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the right approach. Um, so any patient with chronic pancreatitis, um, as I was telling in, you in, in, in my initial slides, that you have to make sure, obviously, uh, exocrine deficiency, endocrine deficiency, those are the things approach first. And among all the blood tests, um, uh, Rajiv asked a specifically very important question is blood sugar. So this patient has normal blood sugars and everything. Um, but uh, a lot of these patients, uh, their um, exocrine pancreatic sufficiency is the, is the one first get affected. Uh, and at the same time, it's so easy. And that's what Dr. Rajiv pinpointed that what is the blood sugar or fasting blood sugar? So that's very important things to look at. So this case gives you one thing that you really don't need to go for a invasive testing or even a costly testing rather than a simple thing. Simple lab test can indicate you the right clinical answer. So uh, with that token, we can go to the next case. Sure, sure. Okay, sorry. So for our next case, we have uh, uh, you are evaluating a 58 year old woman with relapsing pancreatitis. She does not drink or smoke and has no family history of pancreatitis. Liver chemistry and triglycerides have been normal and our mileage is elevated to approximately 3000 with each episode. An abdominal ultrasound notes a normal gallbladder and an MRCP is normal. 
Which of the following would you recommend next? EUS, ERCP with bile analysis, ERCP with SOM, genetic testing, or enteric cholecystectomy? So uh, this is the case uh, where pretty much all the lab test is fine. It doesn't, she doesn't smoke, drink, do not take any over-the-counter uh, medications, uh, not on any um, oral contraceptives. Um, and so far, all the lab test is done um, is negative. Um, and every time she comes to the emergency room, she has elevated amylase and um, sonogram is normal. And obviously there is a um, radiological strata and has sonogram done multiple times in the emergency room and MRCP was done as well. To look for a common bile duct, it, it came out normal. Um, so also this patient has uh, um, workup done for uh, some uh, genetic testing because uh, her family has some genetic disorders. So if we look at this, uh, I'd like to pick up any of my, my old students who rotate with me can answer the question. Um, can you go to the next uh, slides? What can be the answer? So we should go for genetic testing first. Genetic testing, okay. Because no, I just is no the structural... genetic testing is done and okay. it was negative. So, you know. Uh, sir, can it be endoscopic ultrasound? Endoscopic ultrasound. Um, anybody has any other thoughts? ERCP with bile analysis. ERCP with bile analysis. ERCP and bile analysis, okay. Uh, you know, uh, in real life, and sometimes uh, when you talked about a case and uh, present a case, the answer, we, there's two things we look for, well, which is less invasive and which has the maximum yield, maximum sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value. So on that regard, um, if we look at the answer of this case, where... Your CPU bile analysis. Let's see the answer. Your CPU... No, it's endoscopic ultrasonogram. It's, you know, ERCP is more in invasive than endoscopic ultrasonogram. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll tell you the diagnosis of this patient. This patient has, uh, uh, is very interesting case and it's very common. The patient has pancreatic divisum. Pancreatic. Pancreatic divisum. And uh, very interestingly, we did a MRCP and we could not find pancreatic divisum in the MRCP. And, you know, uh, I know uh, the reason uh, Irshad was mentioning uh, ERCP, which makes sense with the bile analysis because he's thinking about microlithiasis. Microlithiasis. Uh, absolutely, and that is the right thoughts. Uh, interestingly, if we look at the data of US, um, U.S. also can do a very good uh, analysis of uh, microlithiasis, just, just sonographic um, images um, versus ERCP. But uh, one interesting question, the reason we, why we put this question is, there's a good number of patients with aberrant pancreatic duct, pancreatic divisums, can be uh, negative on MRCP. I, that's, the, that's my whole reason to uh, put this question here. I think, I think we, uh, MRCP should have uh, sufficient, uh, is MRCP is not sufficient to diagnose uh, pancreas divisum? Mm, no, it is not, number one. That's, what, that's the reason of this question, that MRCP was done, it was negative, it was not. Question is, uh, can US versus ERCP, which is better to diagnose pancreatic divisum? And the study shows that US is a better tool than ERCP. Uh, so when you are thinking about pancreatic divisum and pancreatic uh, aberrant pancreatic ducts, uh, <laughs> including uh, uh, microlithiasis, uh, if again, US is very, operator dependent, if you have a good endoscopist who does US on a regular basis, who does pancreatic US all the time, probably that is the uh, person I would recommend to do the US to do that. Yeah, this, this is the best answer. This is the best answer to do, okay.
Um, next question. Sure. But uh, Eshad mentioned a very important thing, which is very common in Asian subcontinent is microlithiasis in the common bile duct. And that is one of the idiopathic, that 30% cases I was mentioning. And I'm so happy that Eshad mentioning it here because it should not be overlooked. It is very Are important. You... I think, uh, I think one thing uh, I want to mention that in case of gallstone pancreatitis, uh, even if it is due to microlithiasis, uh, we usually uh, find uh, liver function abnormalities, especially raised HGPT, usually. Uh, I don't know uh, what is the situation in other areas, uh, but uh, in case of gallstone pancreatitis, we usually find two, two or three times higher HGPTs uh, most of the cases. Uh, please, uh, I, I want to have some comment of Ashadwa and of, also from Ati. Um, you know, it's a very good question. The, the most important uh, with microlithiasis, is the most important marker we see all the time, if you ask me, is GDP. That became abnormal. STLT is not seldomly abnormal. In fact, most of the time, those who are doing clinical practice, we don't see that much elevation. About 30% time, it can be elevated, yes. GGT can be elevated more than 50% of the time. That's my personal uh, experience. Rarely alkaline phosphatase can be elevated. Um, maybe I'd like to hear from uh, Irshad, uh, his experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually here we found in cholesterol pancreatitis, most of the cases there is raised NTPT in our subcontinent, along with raised gamma GT also. But, uh, as a first line investigation, as we have to do few investigations uh, due to uh, limited resource, we prefer SGPT first. SGPT is most of the cases of cholesterol pancreatitis, which is our uh, experience. Well. Very specific test, but the sensitivity is less. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely right. Jahangir, uh, you have any comment? Mm -hmm. No, no, but uh, what is the uh, sensitivity and specificity of MRCP in case of uh, aberrant pancreatic duct? You would Very good. Uh -huh. Very good. It's about sixty percent, sixty percent cases. So, um, US is higher, about eighty percent. Eighty percent. Yes. Yeah. So that's why uh, you know. Um, um, these are uh, kind of board, board kind of questions. So we just wanted to know uh, our students mm -hmm. just to know which is more, uh, which has a more uh, positive predictive value. So that is a, a reason to, to put it in here. But in, in real life, we, we, we look for many things. And as uh, Rajiv was mentioning that uh, um, a small number of patients who has a high SGPT and GGT, and those are the those are the markers are important. Not everywhere has US, and not everywhere has mm -hmm. best MRC people that possible. Um, and somewhere there is US available, and you don't have good operators. So I think uh, in real life it's completely different mm -hmm. than when you sit for an exams or talk about it. And I think that's the whole idea of today's discussion. Um, so let's go for the next case. Do you think MRCP is not sensitive one to detect pancreas division? It is. It is um, sometimes, of as I told you, that pancreas, pancreas. sixty to sixty-six percent, sixty to sixty-six percent cases. You know, yeah, is, is, is very good. Yes. Yeah. 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 But uh, in fact. Uh, ERCP, if you do it, which is a little more sensitive, but then you have a higher risk of pancreatitis yeah. and higher risk of complications. And you know, it's obviously is more um, uh, more uh, involving. You know, it's more invasive. So that's why we don't do that. In fact, ERCP has a with a good uh, endoscopist. ERCP has a much much higher yield than both US and um, and uh, um, MRCP. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Next slide. Perfect. Yeah. Next We're case. Moving on to our next case. Uh, a 32 year old male with idiopathic chronic pancreatitis is seen in the clinic with 20 pound weight loss over the last four months. 
The patient has had previous CT scan demonstrating pancreatic atrophy with dilated pancreatic duct to 6 mm. He denies abdominal pain and reports a normal appetite. He previously had a fecal elastase of 100 microgram per stool and was started on enteric coated pancreatic enzyme therapy two months ago at a doses of 30,000 USP units with each meal, but weight loss continued. He denies diarrhea. Which of the following would you recommend? Adding an H2 blocker, increasing the dose of enzyme therapy to 90,000 USP units per meal, perform a hydrogen breath test, EUS, ERCP with pancreatic stent plate. So if you go to the body of this case, um, so you know this, this is one of the slides I just discussed. A patient with idiopathic chronic pancreatitis and um, with significant weight loss and CT did show a typical findings. Interestingly, this patient's pancreatic duct is less than 10 millimeter. Um, the patient has normal appetite, has no abdominal pain. You see the fecal elastase of this patient. And uh, uh, his weight loss is continuing, but you can see the doses of the, and I was just mentioning in a slides, uh, uh, about uh, the failure of the uh, treatment, exocrine um, deficiency in chronic pancreatitis and how the patient failing. And uh, that is something need to be addressed. And I think that is the main reason of this question. So I would again uh, ask our students if they can answer this question. Next slide, please. Zaki answered, it, answered the last question right. And I can see one of the bright students, Samuel is here today. Samuel is a very bright guy. He is um, going to start his residency soon. Samuel, do you want to give a shot of this, this, this question? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Atik, uh, sir. Uh, uh, I'd go for actually to increase the dose of enzyme therapy if yes. it shows any kind of improvement. Thank you. Thanks. So I think uh, um, Raj, you can show the answer. Yes, Samuel yes. was paying attention and uh, he is bright anyway, as I told you. So Samuel, where, where are you starting your uh, residency? Where did you sign eventually? Yes, sir. I, I'm going to start my PGY1 in Darcy Shore University Medical Center in New Jersey. Excellent. Thank you, Excellent. That's, that's, that's close to your house, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like a uh, one-hour drive. Yes, you told, you told me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you and thank me. you, sir. I just want to mention, like, it was uh, your rotation, actually, who, uh, which, made, which made me actually really interested in GI. And currently, actually, I'm looking forward to make a career out of it, actually. Thank you for everything. So you're welcome. <clears throat> we welcome. We'll be in touch, and we'll, we'll be. Ha I'll be happy to mentor you for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In fact, we have some some bright minds here today. We have some leaders in Bangladesh here, Dr. Isha, Dr. Rajiv, and Dr. Jahangir. Uh, but you know, we have uh, Rad is here, um, and Joshua is here. So we're going to hear from them. So, you know, this uh, this is a, a very Im important thing. That uh, uh, the simple thing, we have to increase the enzyme therapy and. Um, we eat meals and you have to tell them you have to take it during the meal or after the meal. Um, I would like to ask uh, Irshad, um, I know the pancreatic enzyme is very popular in Bangladesh. Um, do you encounter this problem very often? Not very often, but uh, we encounter uh, uh, sometimes this type of cases. Uh, but uh, this enzyme therapy regarding Bangladesh here, uh, uh, drug that's available in very low doses. 90,000 USP is not available here. 30,000 not available here. It is only 3,000 units. But if we need such therapy for the patient of chronic pancreatitis with exocrine insufficiency, so we usually brought this drug from India. It's available in India, this drug. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I will add uh, the, mm. the, the pancreatic enzymes we have in our country, uh, yeah. most of the cases, these are uh, inadequate in doses and formulations also. 
Uh, mm. So uh, when it uh, when we can uh, uh, procure it from or, or collect it from in, in, in any other countries, uh, sometimes we and, and in most of the cases uh, we see that uh, that enzymes the uh, uh, amount of tablets or the total dose of enzymes it remain inadequate in most of the cases. Uh, in most of the cases, we cannot we we, we fail to accommodate 90,000 USP per mill in most of the cases. And, uh, and, 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 and if, if we, uh, sometimes we can do so, uh, but at the cost of uh, uh, the medicine, to the higher cost of the medicine, in most of the cases, patient uh, can't afford uh, these amount of uh, 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 medications. Thank mm, you. That is something, you know, a very important uh, perspective you mentioned. And you know, uh, believe me or not, uh, pancreatic enzymes um, replacement is is a, is it a, is a also a problem here as well. Um, especially enteric coated, most of the insurance doesn't cover, um, and uh, it's not as as a big problem as Bangladesh. But we do this problem see this problem very often, and most of the companies uh, they they develop a program. Um, so they help the patient who does not have um, money or the insurance doesn't cover 100%. We call it donut hole. So we have a program. So there's something, you know, I think you, uh, one thing we, we have done over the time, we talked to the pharmaceutical company. We said that, listen, you know, our patients who can afford, they're getting it and small number of patients are not getting it. Can you help us to at least create a program to give it to them? So they get that. And also federal government has some programs, they do it. Uh, in Bangladesh, the scenario is different, but yes, um, um, it's totally understandable. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, can we add H2 blocker or PPI? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Make, uh, uh, environment for the enzyme to create sufficient or effective. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. If the, if the if the enzymes are not enteric coated, you have to give it because yeah. if if it's enteric coated, they're protected. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you don't have to do it. But if it's not interrecorded, which is in Bangladesh, most of the cases is not interrecorded. Yeah, yeah. Really that's possible. why we have to add PPI. Or Absolutely. PPI or H2 receptor blocker is the way to go. And yeah. this is a very important point uh, Dr. Ishad make. And I was, I was telling it too, that please make sure that, and that is one of the board questions always been asked. Uh, they mention, they, they don't mention that it is interrecorded or not. And the answer is basically, change it to an enteric coated one or giving the patient H2 reserve blocker or PPI because it's the cheapest option. Yeah. Uh, so this is something very important and they should make, take that the first thing in the day, if, if it's PPI at least an, an, an hour, 45 minutes before they take the breakfast. So the whole day it won't. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think one uh, thing I want to I want to add or ask uh, yeah. in, in 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 most of these patients uh, they require uh, prolonged period I should rather say lifelong enzyme covers uh, pancreatic enzymes and uh, we have to add PPI also for them it's a high dose PPI at least forty milligram twice daily so uh, uh, for this prolonged period of PPI they have uh, multiple adverse effects including uh, including. Uh, osteoporosis, uh, osteoporosis, and mostly uh, uh, infection, enteric infections. Uh, this, so, 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 uh, how how do you suggest? Do you suggest this prolonged period high dose acid suppression? Do you suggest in your country? You know, it's a it's a very very uh, very important question because. Um, you know, one thing I do, I uh, all the students who work with me, they know that I am not a big supporter of PPI. In fact, most of the patients, even the patients who has hyperalgesia or reflux, I try to change it to, to H2 receptor blocker. So one of my goal is to give a famotidine to all the patient instead of one of those PPI. So that is sub first thing I do. And the patients in my slide, I was just mentioned Calcium and vitamin D, I, I, I give it to them. And uh, I, I counsel every patient. In fact, all the students who work with me, they know that I counsel every patient about PPI. Um, and uh, I religiously try to not to them. But this is one case where I try to give H2 receptor blocker first. 
is very cheap. It's significantly cheaper than a PPI and it solves all the problem. Um, it does have a role of, uh, of, you know, after some time the patient get habituated. And those patients, I give them a little bit of time of PPI maybe for six to eight weeks and then go back to H2 receptor blocker again. So that is one, one approach I have. My other approach is um, if they had to take PPI, then I, I, I always add calcium, vitamin D. Uh, yearly, I do a DEXA scan. Uh, if we see osteopenia, yeah. those patients, I also uh, tell them to take medications um, for osteopenia and osteoporosis. So uh, those are the group of patients. I start them a medicine for osteoporosis with calcium and vitamin D as well. So, you know, a lot of things we do preemptively, and this is something very important for us. Uh, is we call it quality measures. Anybody who is put here for some reason, automatically we fall into certain quality measures to prevent this complication here. Um, and this is very important. I think all the young physician in Bangladesh uh, need to learn that, which yes. you mentioned that for any reason we're, we're trying to put this patient PPI, we need to think about the side effects yeah. and what, how we can um, you know, get rid of that. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Jahangi, do you have some comments? Um, yeah, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, all patients use PPI. Uh, yes, uh, yes. I know that is something, you know, uh, one of the area I like to work and, um, you know, as a, uh, one of my interests is uh, esophagus. We have a group of about 50 esophagologists in the world and we met every Feb February. And we talked about it, that whenever a patient is PPI for a long time, we really need to validate the use of PPI. And we at the gastroenterologist can validate that just by doing a, a Bravo pH study or pH study on those patients off PPI. Do they really need that? And another big area we really don't talk about is um, distal esophageal function and the role of uh, hiatal hernia, which is very commonly overlooked, which causes incompetent lower G, I mean, I mean lower uh, esophageal bowel function and lead to many symptoms. And we, 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 we put those, all those patients PPI. So I think we need to, we need to from our side as a gastroenterologist, I, I think we need to do uh, uh, more thorough uh, work on that. In fact, the scenario is same in the United States. And um, those who are very uh, aware of uh, foregut and uh, PPI side effects, we're a little proactive on that, but it's still a lot of uh, um, learning is needed on that basis. You, you mentioned it rightly. Um, so uh, we can go to the next, uh, I think th th that's what uh, he has. Yes, sir, that would be it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Somebody's uh, somebody's uh, phone. I mean, is golden age tennis. Ring that golden age. Know that Djokovic is shining through. Somebody's uh, somebody's uh, somebody's talking. Uh, Every single record that you look at, know that Djokovic right now. It just goes beyond anybody's wildest imaginations. What he has achieved. Okay. Uh, okay, now uh, we can talk a little bit about the cyst and then we'll go to the cyst question. Uh, pancreatic cyst is very common. So we have two kinds of cysts. One is a mucinous cyst, another is non-mucinous cyst. There's two major variety. Among the mucinous cysts, we know the IPMN is the most important one, which is interdactyl papillary mucinous neoplasm. Another is mucinous cyst neoplasm or MCN. And another big variety is non-mucinous, which is serous or inflammatory. And inflammatory is basically a pseudocyst, we know. And uh, also there is something called pseudopapillary or neuroendocrine cyst. So we have two broad, mucinous and non-mucinous. Now, one area is very important for us as a gastroenterologist is called IPMN. And IPMN is basically mucinous variety. That means it causes mucin secretion. And this, this diagram is very nice. This is a typical 
IPMN, which is in the mostly in the head of the pancreas, a cyst, which is always connected to the pancreatic duct, is very less in the body or the tail, and it does have malignant potential. And that's why this is so important to follow up the IPMN. The other variety is a serous cyst, which is usually happen here as well, which is a center scarring. IPMN also happen in the body of the pancreas, in the main pancreatic duct, main duct type, which is not that good. Um, we'll talk about that. And inflammatory is usually in the tail region, and that's a pseudocyst uh, with a lot of debris you can see on the endoscopic ultrasonogram. And we're gonna talk about the mucinous cystic neoplasm, which is the next slide, which is a cyst adenoma or cyst adenocarcinoma. Now, IPMN is a male predominant, happen at the age of 60 or 70 or 80. Mucinous can happen in the younger people, female predominant. It has macrocystic spaces there, I can see that. And it has no communication with the pancreatic duct. That's the hallmark. It does have calcification. You can see the calcifications. Also, it has malignant potential. So IPMN and mucinous cyst neoplasm both need to be evaluated very carefully. On the other way, we have serous cyst adenoma where you see this huge cyst, which has a central scarring right there. And it's more in the female, more in the body, and it does not have any malignant potential. So that also you can diagnose easily just by doing a radiological study. So when we do endoscopic ultrasonogram for evaluation of a cyst, there's few things need to know. When you send a patient for endoscopic ultrasonogram, as you see today, we have three renowned gastroenterologists in our group. Only one institution has US. Two institutions does not have US. They know it very well that if the cyst is not more than three centimeters, it does not need US. If it does not have any enhancing mural nodule, it does not need US. If the duct is not more than 10 millimeter, they don't need to go for US. And that is very important. And when they go for US, these are the things we, 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 we put together. The, when you do a US, we do the morphology and we put a little needle in the cyst cavity and we collect concentration of CEF. We do a cytological analysis and we do a DNA analysis. If you don't do all these three, the US is not that great. Just a morphological diagnosis of US is not that great. When you only just do morphological exam, the yield is only 56%, but you can add 34% on top of that when you do cytology with morphology. When you also add CEA with that, you can reach almost up to 90%. If you add only morphology and CEA concentration, it's as good as 90%. And if you put all three together, it can go up to 90%. So US, just morphological diagnosis of US is not enough. You have to do fluid collection if it's more than three centimeters. And also you have to do measure all these three things to get the best yield. That is one of my point. And also another point is the not every pancreatic cyst need a US. And the other thing is important is when to resect a cyst. If you see in the subsequent MRI or radiological study, the cyst is increasing in size. And if you see the component of the cyst is getting solid, if you see the pancreatic duct is get, getting more than 10 millimeter, if the patient is developing obstructive jaundice, these are the definitive indication to go for cyst resection. And it's very important. And at the end, this is the uh, diagram you, we all need to know. I'm, I'm pretty sure you all know it. Um, it was published in our red journal, Gastroenterology. If you see a cyst in the imaging, you look for positive feature. What are the positive feature? Dilated main pancreatic duct. If the cyst is more than equivalent to three centimeter, or is there any solid component there? If two of them is positive, then you should send those patients for US with FNA. 
If it's not, you repeat the MRI. US and FNA, if you see, oops, if you see there is a concerning cytology, or if you see evidence of any pre-malignant cell or DNA, you go for surgery. If it's not, you repeat the MRI or biannually for next five years. If it's negative, you don't need to do anything. If it's positive, you follow the same cycle again. If it's positive, you go for US and FNA. Initially, if this patient has two or more feature, but if they don't have, the patient go for MRI every year or every other year for next five years. If it's positive, obviously go for US. If it's negative, after five years, you're gonna stop the surveillance. So this is a very good summary and we, we religiously follow that for now. So what I will do at this point, I have some good cases and uh, Joshua, you can present the first case. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you all for having me, especially Dr. Atik and Dr. Rao Shah. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'll begin by sharing screen. Okay, can you all see this? Um, yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So the first case, a 65-year-old male had a CT scan for evaluation of symptomatic kidney stone. He is found to have a three centimeter pancreatic cyst in the body of the pancreas without mural nodules or septations. The main pancreatic duct is four millimeters. Otherwise, the pancreas appears normal. His family history is notable to pancreatic cancer and a paternal uncle. He denies previous pancreatitis. And then we'll move on to the lab findings. He's referred for an EUS, which notes a three centimeter simple appearing cyst without nodules or septations. Cyst aspiration included amylase of 5,800, CEA of 452, and normal cytology, but scant cellularity. We have our first question. What would you recommend now? So if you go to the very first slide, um, um, can you please go to the very first slide? So we have a patient who has no, not at all, we are concerned about uh, any pancreatic disease. It's an incidental finding that he has a three centimeters cyst uh, in the pancreas uh, without any moral nodule and septation. And uh, the moment he heard that he has uh, something in the pancreas, he get really nervous and he get really uh, hyperactive and anxious and he wanted to make sure that he does not have any pancreatic cancer and he doesn't drink alcohol, he's not a smoker. So that's why um, anyway, he's more than 60 years old and his pancreatic is four millimeter. Um, the next slide, please. And we see the cyst is three centimeters. So if the cyst is, more, is three centimeters or more, um, the, and we can go for a US and that's what we did. And we see that, that, that without any nodules or septations and the cyst aspiration, as you can see that is all normal. So what will be the next step? Next slide. So again, I would ask my, uh, if you just if we just talk about the the flow sheet I just show, if you can answer. Um, I'm sorry. The student, if you can. Sir, answer MRI. 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 It's maybe sir MRI in one year. Excellent. In fact, uh, the answer was in that slide. So that's yes, patients first year, or every two years we can do an MRI. Uh, Joshua, can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> yeah, that is the answer. So. Um, in fact, we're discussing this yesterday in, in, uh, with some of the students uh, in, in, in uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday in, in, our, in our clinic. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Rajib, uh, as you have US in your institution and you have MRI and everything, you probably encounter it more often and you have probably referred cases coming from all over. Um, so uh, are, you, are you doing the um, US uh, uh, um, and the, 
cytology and CA on a regular basis in Bangabandhu? No, no. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we, we do have a US machine in our institution, in our department, but uh, uh, it, has been, it, has not, it has not been that long. Uh, first, uh, secondly, uh, still we don't have that uh, expertise, uh, especially for uh, intervention, especially for uh, therapeutic uh, procedure. Uh, still, we have to go a long way regarding U.S., especially for ten uh, uh, faculties, and, and and to develop a special uh, develop expertise in this regard. Uh, we do not have uh, therapeutic in U.S. Uh, yet. You know, um, thanks for telling me because we were just talking um, uh, to Ishad. That was. Uh, thinking about doing a, a conference, international conference in Kitagong from the Society of Bangladesh College of Gastroenterology. So, so, you know, we're talking that maybe on the time we can bring um, one of the world-renowned teacher of US in Bangladesh, and maybe we can have one session in, in, in uh, Bangabundu. Uh, you are there, so inshallah we can arrange one so we can firsthand have some patient ready and uh, teach some. We can also develop a, a good pathologist who can get to read the psychology well, um, learn with our biliary and uh, pancreatic uh, pathologist. So I think uh, there's a lot of room for cooperation in future to do that. Um, and also the places uh, where Jahangir, my, my, my classmates in Silat, we can also talk about uh, how can we help them to have poor US or train the staff for US. I know uh, uh, Irshad sent Dr. Ali Haider in uh, US and uh, he uh, was trained with very famous uh, um, US specialist, Dr. Young, um, uh, the president of American Society of Gastric and Endoscopy and Dr. Muhammad Hassan, who's like uh, one of the world-renowned uh, US guy. So uh, we can at least train somebody in future. Um, so we can do that. I'm looking forward to work together with Rajiv and Jahang in, in future. Thank you. I think very, uh, uh, I should, uh, I should uh, add that if you, if you talk about cooperation, so this is uh, <coughs> especially for BSMU, <coughs> also for other places, other institutions among the Silet Medical or Chirag Medical, where uh, Professor Sharan, Professor Jahang is there. So, uh, yeah, we get cooperation, bilateral <coughs> advancement. This is, is, is one of the arena where there's much places to improve, much to improve from. No, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to Jahangir, um, uh, next time when you'll come to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to bring, um, not only me, you know, I hear um, a person who does US, he does US whole day. Uh, unfortunately, fortunately, we have one of the world famous pancreatic guys here in Orlando. Uh, one is Sham Varazolo, another is Rob Hoss, another is Mama Hassan, uh, Dr. Aryan. Uh, these are like, uh, you can tell the leading uh, pancreaticologist in the world. So next time when we'll come to Bangladesh, I'll bring one of them with me. So you can learn it from the masters um, and uh, you guys can find out who do you want to train. Um, and we can do a course um, maybe in BMSSU and BSMMU and uh, people from all over the country can watch it. Uh, uh, you know, nowadays that's how we do it. So there's a lot of opportunity. Next case, Joshua. <laughs> A seven-year-old woman is from the emergency room after a CT scan performed for possible renal stone identifies a pancreatic cyst. The patient has no current GI complaints, no weight loss, and feels otherwise well. Her physical examination is normal. Next slide. Lab testing, no. uh, lab testing including liver chemistries, amylase, and CA9 are normal. You read the CT scan, which notes a five centimeter cyst in the body of the pancreas. The cyst has multiple small microcystic components and a central scar. 
the pancreas appears otherwise normal. So uh, I was just talking about it. Uh, so most of the pancreatic cyst is incidental throughout the whole world, especially in our practice where there's older patients who went to for some kidney stone or some abdominal pain has a M CT scan done or MRF done and there's some cystic lesion. So you have multiple options and there's one very important thing is mentioned in the previous, uh, previous slide. Can you, um, can you go for that? Uh, that is the cyst, the cyst has multiple small microcystic component with a central scarring. So it basically gives you all the answer. So the next uh, slide, uh, I, would, I, would, I would leave it up to the uh, students. Uh, one of you can answer. What is the answer? Serous cystinoma. Serous cystinoma. It's very nice. The central scarring. Uh, so it's one of the benign. Um, so the answer, uh, go to the next slide, Joshua. So thank you. So yeah, so and we, we do see it quite often, especially in the older patients. So uh, that's so that's one uh, things you can um, we can always see. I'm just curious about serous cyst adenoma in Bangladesh. Eshad, uh, do you see it often, serous cyst adenoma? No, because uh, uh, as you know, we have limited investigation facilities. No CT scan MRI is available, uh, but we generally cannot do other investigation. Mm -hmm. but, uh, there is the amazing feature is diagnostic of therapeutic adenoma. We can really see the investigation. I got it. Thank you. Rajiv, uh, because you're in BSMU, is, is there any, 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 do you see it most often? Of or? Case, yeah, most of the cases, these are incidental findings. Uh, yes, uh, rarely they become symptomatic, uh, uh, unless there's some malignant change and uh, 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 so we rarely encounter these cases. Yeah, in fact, I have a patient, uh, and uh, the patient uh, is a VIP in Bangladesh, and he has an uh, incidental finding of his father, and um, so, but they wanted to send the patient to, to Singapore, but the gastroenterologist in Bangladesh is very good. He told that nothing needs to be done. Um, your father can be followed here next year. So, but they asked me for a second opinion and I look at the result, um, I look at them MRI and I say, yep, he was right. So, and uh, he was very reassured. And, uh, and you know, um, I, I see that the folks over there are doing a great job. Next, uh, next, uh, next case. A 22-year-old male is seen in your clinic for relapsing pancreatitis. He reports episodes beginning at age 10, but was not diagnosed with pancreatitis until age 13. He has required six hospital admissions for acute pancreatitis. There is no family history of pancreatitis. He now reports chronic pain along with painful flares, which occur approximately once yearly. Amylase and lipase are elevated with each attack, but liver chemistry and triglycerides have been normal. Several CT scans, which show a non dilated pancreatic duct and We have a very similar Genetic testing for yeah. cystic fibrosis. Okay, why well, you were thinking about cystic fibrosis, Jackie? Yeah? Uh, sorry, pancreatic insufficiency. Okay. Uh, uh. So let's see the answer.
but it is uh, high. And uh, this patient has recurrent pancreatitis. All the uh, workup was done is negative. Um, MRCP was done. Uh, next, uh, you know, so this, this patient is a reminder that uh, these are the patients we should do uh, the genetic testing. So this is a, a important reminder after you do all the workup. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Shad, do you do any genetic testing of any patients uh, for pancreatic disease or um, other GI problem? Do we have any genetic labs in Bangladesh yet or? No, not that testing. Mm -hmm. Jahangir or Rajiv, any? No, no. Uh... Yes, we have, have <laughs> like... genetic lab. Uh, BSN has started genetic lab, uh, though uh, a bit late. Uh, but uh, in most of the cases, uh, in most of the instances, uh, uh, we can't uh, ask uh, for uh, whatever we want uh, for genetic testing. Uh, we have to uh, inform them, inform them uh, 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 appropriate time earlier, because uh, uh, they have to procure the primers for for that specific disease condition for the specific chromosome and abnormal villages. Uh, so they are not readily available. Uh, they are uh, available in, in very few cases, uh, like Wilson's disease or something like that. Very very known cases. And for pancreatic disease, uh, uh, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think there is any uh, uh, scope for genetic testing in Bangladesh. So maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I didn't hear uh, any genetic testing happening for pancreatic disease in Bangladesh. No, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, so I think these are the questions uh, Joshua has. Uh, we can close Joshua's window. So, um, you know, um, thank you, Joshua. You did a great job. And Raj, you did a great job um, presenting the cases um, in a summary. Uh, obviously, we it wasn't uh, detailed cases, but I think a lot of areas, uh, it provoke a very good discussion. So uh, tell us a, a few a reminder about few things we commonly uh, mistake or overlooked. And I'm also very proud of my students who are <laughs> currently rotating with me, they answered everything very well. Um, so I would like to say a few words um, about today's discussion. First, I will start with uh, uh, Ishad. Thank you for your invitation to join this program. Uh, we enjoyed the session very much, particularly presentation of uh, Dr. Raj and Joshua was excellent and the uh, query that was uh, presented by them that was also think probably and your fellows are uh, not wise to answer the uh, very well. Uh, we also learned a lot from this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you, Shad. Thank you. And now I would uh, Request Jahangir to say a few words. Mm -hmm. sure. Thanks, uh, Dr. Atik, to invite me. Uh, and I learned a lot of things from you and uh, your. Uh, <clears throat> and the pancreas and pancreatic uh, cyst is a very uncovered uh, in our uh, settings. Uh, hopefully, we will. Uh, uh, extend your hands in cooperation to uh, when I co yeah, cover this area. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jangi. Uh, you know, you know. I already wholeheartedly take your invitation. Mm -hmm. Next time we'll make a good plan. I have one uh, request to Esha. These wholeheartedly help us whenever I call Esha. This Esha is a and today, both of you, Rajiv was very nice. Last time when I visited Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, he invited me in his department. He arranged a small program, though there was no formal talk, but we have a mutual agreement signed mm -hmm. with his department with the work. So I was hoping that if every month, mm -hmm. if we can do a, a case presentation 
you know, among all the gastroenterology department in Bangladesh, mm. whoever can join. And so the uh, two fellows or two young physicians from Bangladesh or two, three cases, we can discuss our uh, faculties from here can join mm. as well. And we can also give a prize for the best presentation. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking to all of you if we can do that. And especially uh, Rajib has the MD course in, in, in VSMMU. So Rajib can help us with that. Um, so last not least, I will ask Rajib to say a few words. Uh, uh, thank you, Abhijay. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm just grateful uh, for inviting me and letting me in uh, in your arena. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, secondly, the presentations, uh, the presenters uh, really uh, they presented it very well, uh, quietly, quite in, in, in quite understandable way. Uh, we could understand uh, each and every uh, every uh, segment what they were uh, expressing. Uh, and the important thing, the way of today's discussion, today's presentation. Uh, you, you just uh, uh, you just uh, presented some of the uh, uh, the overall view of the disease, and thereafter provoked some questions. Uh, the style was very nice, also. Uh, in our institution, uh, uh, in our day starts with morning session. In, in most of the days, at least three to four days. Uh, 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 from the of, of one of uh, present any case of, of an admitted patient, so we are uh, quite uh, habituated uh, with this case presentation uh, 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 tradition. I should rather say, uh, since uh, we were uh, MD resident in 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 two thousand four, five, or six, uh, Shadvai uh, and me was uh, in the same session. In BSM, as MD gastroenterology resident. So uh, it is uh, gastroenterology or any case, when this is ever learning process. Uh, in, in our special, in our country, uh, one thing I think I has mentioned, we have a real world is doing uh, US, he is doing US all day. But in BSM or any other institution, we have uh, multiple uh, business. We are probably we are jack of all traps and master of none. So this is the, this is the problem in 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 in, in BSM or in any other institution. Uh, for academic uh, discussion also, we do get a very few uh, opportunity to to refresh us to rejuvenate re us uh, in, in in the theoretical and clinical cases. So whenever we get opportunity, uh, whenever I get opportunity. I try to, I will try to, especially. on Friday and, and you bring those cases um, um, and you did it quickly and uh, uh, I'm very grateful to you guys and in future we'll do more cases. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, students, you, you guys did well. Very, very good. I'm very proud of you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank sorry. you, sir. It, it was you, sir, not us. No, no. <laughs> yes, sir, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I, I think maybe need for speed for speed. Hello? I think maybe. Sir, so I guess I'm going to go. Thank you, sir. Thank you.